Hello everyone. Um, I'm just going to start. And if a couple more people trickle in, that's that's all very well. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's a pretty horrific day for the weather, so you, you braved the weather. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ivor Williams. Uh, I'm a designer at the Helix Centre, which is part of the Institute of Global Health Innovation, and I lead the end of life care and hospice projects here at the IGHI. Um, so, welcome to the Global Health Forum. Um, the Health Forum is uh, a little spiel, a platform to bring together researchers, students and staff from across uh, Imperial's faculties to highlight, discuss and disseminate findings on current research and innovations in rel relevant global health topics. And today I'm very, very happy to be talking about innovation in children's hospice care. Um, these Health Forums take uh, place on a monthly basis and they've been going for a number of years. And in fact, uh, this year, 2020, marks 10 years of the Institute itself, which is uh, a great achievement. Um, I'm sure some exciting things will be part of that. Um, just announce that we are we like to live tweet, if you like to use Twitter. We do have the hashtag uh, IGHI Forum, so feel free to smatter that across your Twitter if you want to talk about it. Um, and also our handle is imperial uh, underscore IGHI. So I'm going to talk for uh, a couple of minutes to just introduce this topic, introduce the Institute, introduce our, uh, introduce our work, if you're not familiar with who we are, uh, and then I'm going to introduce uh, our amazing speakers who are going to talk about a wide breadth of uh, interesting topics. Um, and what's interesting for me around this idea of uh, innovation in healthcare um, is the kind of history that we kind of find ourselves in when we talk about innovation. Um, so this is, you know, during an interview with a consultant, um, kind of just kind of lays his stuff out on his pockets. And the idea that the, the, the symbols of what make a doctor, the stethoscope, um, the pager, as much as it's derided, is still a, a kind of interesting symbol. And of course, the kind of smartphone, which represents everything that is modern about uh, uh, healthcare. Um, and you know, when we think about what innovation is, it goes all the way back to the 1850s. You know, the, let's not forget the stethoscope was a really important and still is a very important part of, of care and medicine. And that had to be invented at one point, and that had to be, it was new and interesting at one point. Um, I also like to just reflect on the fact that the pages are that old. The first one was introduced in 1950 in uh, New York, um, and we're still living with them. So it tells you about how long the kind of the innovation kind of trail actually is for many things. Um, just a thought about who we are. So the Institute of Global Health Innovation sits within Imperial. Um, we have a number of dedicated centres that range from uh, health policy through to robotics. Uh, the Patient Safety Translational Research Centre is a really massive part, uh, but also the Helix Centre, which is uh, what I am part of, um, is a major part of the Institute. And again, the, the, the kind of more obvious things that we think about when it comes to especially Imperial is the type of innovation that comes through things like the robotics. This is um, Phil Pratt and his team's um, work around uh, augmented reality for surgery, which uh, I've never actually seen this photo until I actually kind of was grabbing it today and it's like, it's so sci-fi, sci it's amazing. Um, but I find like when we talk about innovation in healthcare, this is kind of what people might assume, especially if they think that they're kind of cutting edge. Um, but that's you know one element of what we do. Um, so if we think about broadly the types of things that we do at the institute, that ranges from designing physical products that might be the augmented reality for uh, surgery, but we also do and create digital products. We create services. We think about systems and strategies as well. So this is a wide range of things that we consider under the umbrella of innovation. Um, we're on the other building here, but part of where the helix is situated is in this glass and wooden box. Um, situated right between the buildings, the, the university and the hospital. And that's a unique thing that we have, is the fact that we're kind of centered and grounded right in the kind of clinical environment. Um, 
and the work that we do at IGHI kind of crosses between uh, the design and technology expertise that we have at the Helix with the clinical and academic and engineering ex expertise across other centers and other parts of the institute. And of course, at the heart of it is really working with uh, patients, families, and public and healthcare professionals who make up exactly who we're designing for eventually. And it really is at the heart of what we do as, as, a, as an institute to make sure that we are designing for people's needs, responding to those needs, and actually finding things and solutions that will fit and work and really excel in the, in the ways in which people are trying to solve problems or trying to improve their health, trying to improve their life. And this is a kind of core element of the, the innovation uh, process that Alessandro will be talking about later on. Um, and just to say that, you know, the work that we do isn't just situated inside the university. It's uh, increasingly global, especially with the end-of-life care work. Um, and we work with different organizations, institutes, charities, um, other NHS trusts to really make sure that our work is uh, scaled and sustained in those different places. So when we think about what do we make, uh, we have, especially at the Helix, kind of three buckets of work uh, around early detection and screening, um, effective treatment and holistic care. And the types of projects and the types of phases of work in which this is uh, done ranges from what we, where we might prototype a potential a series of solutions according to a, a kind of a clinical gap or an opportunity for new technologies. Um, we might actually go all the way through to clinical evaluation, and we might actually create spin-outs where we will create IP and spin-out and create ventures. Um, and that is a large part of how we might think about having the type of penetration that innovation can take into the healthcare system and beyond. So we kind of really work everywhere. We do all types of work. So I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the end-of-life care and hospice work that we've done at the Institute and I think will just helpfully frame up a number of the, the, the speakers that are going to be talking in a minute. So one of the first projects that we have uh, which is in, in a way uh, very successful in terms of its, its uh, uh, growth through the UK is our work around end-of-life care in hospitals which was really about enabling patients to document emergency care preferences and also at the same time empowering clinicians to make informed decisions around uh, emergency care uh, and, and emergency care settings. And this project was, uh, has been now called RESPECT. Um, if you are familiar with this, if you're a healthcare professional, you might have uh, seen this uh, in the wild. But essentially what it is, is it's a process where people are able to better capture their preferences for emergency care decisions. Uh, in the case, basically, this project was form, formed originally around resuscitation in hospital settings. And really, the, the core part of this is really bringing the patient and the person back into the center of that decision making. Whereas before, it was wholly a clinical decision that was supposed to be including the patients and family. The idea that this respect process designed in the conversation between uh, patients, their family, and, and their clinical team. What's also an important part of this is that when we try and create a new process or bring something new into the NHS is really supporting it to actually have the kind of uh, success that it needs, which in this case was around building a digital training tool that supported the, the actual difficult conversations that might be uh, around these emergency care decisions and actually building the capabilities for young doctors particularly who you know are doing these things on the hoof and they're learning them say at two o'clock in the morning having to kind of have these very intense conversations and designing for their needs. So in this case, building a very capable uh, web app that meant that it could be used in all settings where there was no Wi-Fi in your ward um, and building around the needs of a young doctor who just needs the right piece of information at the right time. Um, so that's one big project that we've done. Um, the second was around thinking about where we might improve end-of-life care in the home. And our goal here was really to make critical illness and end-of-life care planning mainstream, to really try and break down the barriers between uh, a doctor or GP who might help create what's called an advanced care plan, and for families uh, and patients and people who want to make sure that their, their care decisions are respected and carried through the process uh, uh, when they get to the end of life. And our result was to create a digital platform called AMBER, which simply was about making uh, easy to make advanced care plans. 
and it was a really powerful way for us to understand exactly the the real holistic needs of people who might be living with a life limiting condition and how they might capture those decisions that says you know when it comes down to it these are the decisions that are really important to me these are the things that matter and finding a way to use technology to connect uh, their decisions to the to, to their loved ones who can help them to the eventually to the health services that can uh, help them execute those decisions. And what's really interesting is the challenges that come with trying to bring innovation through from a patient-centered point of view and pushing it all the way through the NHS and finding out exactly where the closed doors are, where the kind of impossible barriers are, and trying to kind of scale these things is a really interesting challenge that we've learned internally as, you know, where the kind of uh, the best use of um, technologies can be made. So although AMBAR was an incredibly effective way of capturing uh, and bringing and grounding around the person, the kind of uh, state of the NHS in terms of how we might share data is still not quite where we'd like to be, um, which is obviously a huge part of what it means to be doing uh, healthcare innovation. And so lastly, um, to ground this topic, um, a third area that we've been looking at over the last year or so, two years now, is around hospice care for children and really explicitly understanding how we might u utilize new technology and new models of care to support families uh, and children. And <clears throat> if you are uh, new to this topic area, um, I guess I'll just ground this by saying that globally, as well as locally, um, hospices face many <coughs> issues. Um, one of the large issues is how we might deliver care for the whole life of a child rather than just the end of life. Um, there's, it's particularly amongst the kind of public perception that hospice care is, you know, especially children's hospice, where you might go to die, which is obviously uh, an interesting kind of mental image that people may have. But also this idea that the, the complex needs of children as they grow and uh, grow older and uh, have increasingly complex conditions is how we might tie all these things together in a very kind of uh, 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 coherent way. There's also, as we discovered, a lack of uh, data-led evidence that might cal uh, validate new care models. And so the, the, the role of research in, in general is uh, a very kind of significant part of uh, improving uh, hospice care. And I'm really excited to see how Ellen's going to bring her research background to talk about these kind of topics. Um, and the two large other areas that we particularly think are interesting are the idea to provide real continuous care um, from home to hospital to the hospice. These are places where families are often moving around and how we might actually make something that's far more uh, coherent and uh, connected. And as a result of that is the idea that for many families, there's a real lack of personalization as to how these services might be delivered. Um, and I think this is really kind of at the uh, elemental part of what it means to be person-centered and patient-centered, is how we can actually make things that fit that person. Um, this is just quickly a, a, a mapping uh, that we used in our projects. Um, Alessandro may also mention this as well, but the idea that we wanted to understand is to try and coherently show how complex the experience for families can be in terms of all the myriad things that might be going on in the life of a child. And so for as designers, part of our job is how can we actually make visual that which is complex or intangible. And I think the complexity of uh, uh, care for a child is, is one of the biggest issues uh, uh, in this kind of space. And I think we're going to hear it a lot about this in the talks. And I guess the question might be, well, what can design do? How can design help? Um, and I think, I hope by the end of this session today, you'll have a, a, a clearer idea as to what we think design can do and the, the real kind of role that design has as a, as a practice, as a uh, profession, but also how it can really work with the various people involved in, say, children's hospice care where people are often innovating in very generous ways and very kind of interesting new ways, though they might not call it that, the idea that there's lots of opportunities for design and technology to unlock the kind of, uh, and unpick the, the kind of systemic complex problems that exist uh, in, in the field. And 
I often, when I think about design and what it can do, I kind of go back to uh, a designer from the 1960s, Victor Papenik, and he was a big proponent of what we might now call social design. And for him, the only important thing was how design relates to people. That is at the heart of what we try to do uh, at the Institute with, with our design innovation work. And the, the great kind of way in which I think that is embodied um, is in a very simple story um, from uh, the US. Um, this is a, a teddy bear that uh, was given to me as a gift um, by a mother. And for me, it's a really powerful story about what it means to have the kind of insights that people may have that really allows them to understand the, the problems of people. In this case, the mother who um, lost a child uh, found that, and she lear later learned that in hospices in the US particularly, they'll, they'll often, if a parent loses a child, they may leave uh, the hospice without their child. And so the, the absence of holding a baby or holding a small child can be a very kind of, uh, it's a very kind of uh, pivotal moment in someone's experience. And the mother was, was driven by her experience to create these teddy bears that allows mothers who may have lost a child to leave the hospital or the hospice with something around their arms. Nothing can change the, 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 the kind of trauma and the horrible experience of losing a child, but this idea that a mother wanted to share with other mothers this object that she felt might ease the pain. And I think that, for me, is a really powerful symbol of what it means to have the kind of insights and to, to be able to want to make things that can really support people in their own life journeys. Um, so I think I'll finish with that for me. Um, so what we have coming up is, first we have Sue, who's going to be talking about um, the Scottish perspective of transforming children's hospice care. We'll then have Gabriella. Um, speaking from, a, uh, uh, from her life experience as a parent. Um, Ellen's going to be telling us more about the kind of uh, uh, role of uh, in internet innovation in engaging with children. And lastly, we have Alessandra, who's going to speak about the uh, Italian palliative care children's hospice project that we have been working with them with. So first up, I think Sue. Thank you very much. My name is Sue Hogg and I'm, um, I work at, uh, in a children's hospice service uh, called Children CHAS, Children's Hospices Across Scotland. Um, and I have this little picture. We talked about children's hospices as a building and this picture comes from Rachel House, which is one of the two children's hospices in Scotland. And I came in to Rachel House one Monday um, to see this on the door on one of the doors and it was drawn by a little uh, girl called Abby and she'd uh, um, done this picture to say uh, welcome to Rachel House it was a picture on the door this is where the impossible happens and and I just thought it was so such a lovely thing to see about a, a children's hospice but when I look at the looked at the picture really closely actually the impossible she'd drawn the impossible and what that meant to her um, and it was being arty soft play water play garden tv and more now that doesn't feel very impossible to me but to her that was really really important and that was what mattered to her in in um in a children's hospice or in a building so i just i i think we should never lose sight of that but just to, um, Rachel House was where it all started for Chaz. That was our very first children's hospice founded by parents who um, recognised that actually they needed something in Scotland. And Rachel House has been there for 24 years now. Um, but Chaz has grown. Um, we've had, a, I suppose, a huge amount of experience being alongside families whose children have life-shortening, life-limiting conditions. Um, and... And so Chaz has grown to, to, with that emerging need and with our experience. And so we now have two children's hospices, one in the east of Scotland, one in the west. But we have four uh, 
at home hospice at home teams. We have um, a number of um, Diana children's nurses, they're hospital based nurses, nurse specialists, and we have a number of um, paediatricians, consultants uh, who are jointly appointed with the NHS but very much based in the NHS and uh, funded by CHAS and, and, and working alongside CHAS um, delivering uh, children's, what we call children's hospice care but it's about so much more than, than a, a hospice building, um, delivering it to children wherever they are. Um, and CHAS, our strategic statement of intent, you know what it is that we say we do. Um, we developed our, we used to do all of our kind of planning for the service in, in partnership with families. We hope, try to really involve them in finding out what matters to them, what should we be doing, how, how do they want us to deliver care. Um, and what is, you know, that helped us form our strategic um, intent or, you know, what it is that we do, what's important to us. And the words in colour uh, come from families themselves. We wanted to include that. Um, but actually, what we say we want to do is make sure that children have the opportunity for experiences they can't have elsewhere, to feel the wind and sunshine on their faces, to sparkle, to laugh, to smile, and have those memorable moments of joy that will be treasured forever. And that, it was really important to have families' words reflected in, in what it is we say we want to do. But we have become slightly obsessed with data um, over the last few years as a children's hospice service. Um, and we were very fortunate. We had Lorna Fraser um, did a study called the CHISP study. Um, I can share links for that um, um, uh, back in 2011. I think it was Lorna's uh, first report was published, 2010 or 2011. We have since... Um, revisited that and refreshed that data in Scotland, but it's a, a kind of a, the, one of the first whole country, full country data collections um, uh, looking at the, the numbers of children with life limiting conditions and palliative care needs um, in Scotland. And we, can, we know from that work that the need for care is growing. Um, there are almost 16,000 children in Scotland with a life limiting condition who may need a, a palliative care at any one time. Of, and we know they're um, out there in the population because they have a, a, a diagnostic code that, um, of a life-shortening condition and they are receiving a prescription of some sort in, in Scotland. Um, of that, about 6,000 have some kind of hospital contact um, at any one time and about 2,000 of those are considered to be unstable, um, deteriorating or dying. And every year about 200 children in Scotland die from a life shortening condition. We also know from the data that most children do not die in a hospice. The pale blue um, is hospital, of course, the vast majority of children die in hospital and hospice is that tiny little purple um, bit in the middle, um, so the least, uh, uh, the, the least uh, likely place of death and that those are broken down into age, uh, age groups. We also know that the prevalence of life shortening or life limiting conditions is highest amongst those who are most deprived in, in Scotland. There's about a 10% higher prevalence in the poorest areas of Scotland um, of children with life limiting conditions. And the prevalence is also higher in those of South Asian ethnicity. So all of this data is starting to kind of uh, help drive our service. The CHISP study, that original Lorna Fraser study that I talked about um, and we've refreshed the numbers, I think is one of the loveliest reads, um, really good read. They did also a literature review looking at the emotional um, and psychosocial needs of families and the standout needs are that actually specialist emotional support is important, families find domestic life overwhelming um, and keeping up with that is, is hard. Specialist residential provision, so the kind of things children's hospices do, is really valued and important. Um, families feel socially isolated and discriminated against and that they want to be mum and dad and that that's not always possible in hospital or clinical settings. So a really worth, worthwhile re reading that report. Okay. We talked um, to, uh, as part of, at the moment, we're, we're doing a lot of strategy planning and we've 
intentionally spoke to siblings and they created this um, collage from magazines as part of our kind of discussions with them, trying to say what is it that you value about hospice support. And the things they told us, and I'm just going to read some, some quotes, they, they ripped up magazines and, and created this, but they feel isolated and lonely, they have complex emotions, they are bullied, they need help at school, and that Chaz, as a hospice service, gets them. And the kind of things they told us were, my life is really hard and it upsets me every day. I don't tell people at school about my brother. I'm too scared and I don't want to be bullied. Teenagers stare and laugh at us. I can't go out with my brother. I don't have, have to help with my family at Chaz. I don't like having to do feeds when I'm having, trying to sleep or having to get up early to help. So we are, you've caught us, you know, for this talk at a time where we're thinking, actually, we, we, we see all this data, we're starting to understand the scale of the need um, in terms of numbers. The complexity is, is huge. It's not just all about clinical care. Um, and so we're starting to think, what do we as a service need to do and to, to, um, to meet that need? And so we're starting to think, where does our focus have to go? So, I mean, this is purely us playing about with the numbers um, in terms of 16,000 children. We want to reach everybody. We want to make sure all of those children have access to good palliative care when they need it. But where do we focus? The 200 who die every year at the top, we actually we think our service can offer excellent end-of-life bereavement care in hospice, hospital at home. We want to help families with complex decision-making. Um, and we need to be able to respond to planned and unplanned care. Of that 6,000 in the middle, those people who are children who are in and out of hospital, we think that they are likely to need planned respite care, again, multi-professional multi care in, in all settings, financial advice, volunteer help at home perhaps, and, and the group, that 10,000 children who are probably quite stable but could at any point need palliative care, actually who do we connect with in the wider system, in wider services um, to ensure that, um, palliative, that, that teams are equipped to deliver palliative care or to refer them very quickly to us. And we're looking at all sorts of things like pharmacy, community pharmacy networks, um, promoting anticipatory care planning conversations, um, looking at um, online platforms like Project ECHO to support communities of, of practice, to share expertise, to democratise palliative care expertise and to raise awareness about uh, what CHAS does. Ivor asked me just to highlight a few things that he, he said, you know, talk about a few things that you think that people would be interested in. And one of the um, projects we've been working on a lot is using volunteers. And I have to say, with the scale of need out there, I think it is absolutely essential that we look to see what can volunteers do to get alongside families and, and help support. And so we now have um, teams of volunteers who are um, matched with families and do domestic, help with domestic work in the homes, gardening, ironing, taking brothers and sisters, siblings to um, after school clubs, etc. And there's just a couple of quotes from um, families about um, how rubbish volunteers are at fighting with lightsabers. Um, uh, hospital team, you've got Ellen from Louis and Das um, Centre here. Um, and in Scotland until recently, we had no hospital based team such as they have in Great Ormond Street. But when we look at the numbers of children in, in Scottish hospitals um, who are, uh, have life-shortening conditions, it's absolutely essential that we get our services into hospitals. Our NHS colleagues want to do this, um, and, they, and so we are funding uh, the first uh, supportive and palliative care team in Scotland. They launched last um, autumn, probably about September, that, that team first uh, uh, started. And that was a rainy day in Scotland um, in September where they had their photograph taken. Um, but the day after we did the press launch for the team a few months um, later, uh, we had a parent 
wrote on Facebook, pub, you know, we, it was out on Facebook, and she talked <coughs> about actually she was one of the first families to work um, with this team in intensive care and compared her visit to intensive care with, as a different experience uh, to when she'd been before and that the, the doctor made her feel instantly welcome and listened to her every concern that I had as a mother to a palliative child. And thanks to the team, I was able to spend Ellie's last night on earth with her overnight in PICU. The staff made sure I had a bed in her room. And it goes on that, you know, I, I just think it, it, families are, are um, you know, so happy so willing to talk about their experience of good palliative care. So for Chaz, what's next? I've not talked an awful lot about our hospice buildings, but they absolutely continue to be at the heart of what we do. Um, uh, but our, we really want to focus on actually taking our care beyond the building and out to everywhere. And we want to do a focus on, on our hospice at home service. And I, I think it's lovely to come to a design, a service design um, uh, forum because I think that's what's really needed in terms of shaping, rethinking what our services need to look like in order to reach that many children. We want to do more in hospital. I think we want to work with siblings. Well, I know we want to work with siblings and we want hospice care to be everywhere. And that is me. Sorry, that's a whistle -top stop. <laughs> I possibly overran. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, so I'm just going to swap over. Yes. So next we have Ellen. Um, take it away. Hi, everyone. So my name is Ellen Henderson. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> That's not a great start. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm coming from just down the road at the Louis Dundas Centre for Children's Palliative Care, which is a joint clinical and academic unit based between uh, UCL and Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk today about the challenges and opportunities for engaging children receiving palliative care and their parents in research. And I'm posing a question to you about if there is a role for internet innovation as part of this process. Um, and when we talk about some learning objectives in advance of today's uh, talk, I came up with four questions, or three questions, and maybe an example. So I'm going to, first of all, outline who are the children who need palliative care. Um, Sue's already discussed a little bit about the Scottish context. I'm going to talk about the UK as a whole. I'm, I'm going to use an exemplar from a research study that we developed late last year around the well-being of parents of children with life-limiting conditions who are undertaking a caring role for their child um, to talk about some of the issues that they discussed in participating in research, which could potentially be addressed by innovations in internet-based research. I want to talk a little bit about how internet innovation has served this population of parents of children with life-limiting conditions to date. And then I want to pose the question, which hopefully we can engage in some discussion around, is how should we innovate further to serve these children and families? So when we talk about the population of children with life-limiting conditions, who are we talking about? Lorna Fraser, in her 2010 study looking at the UK as a whole, established there are 49,000 babies, children and adolescents living with a life-limiting condition in the UK. Uh, the most common diagnosis is uh, congenital an anomalies, and this is a growing group. And this, uh, as we also determined as part of some of our own research, these children are cared for in home, hospital, and hospice. And moving quite frequently between those places of care, which presents its own challenges. They also are cared for by multiple healthcare professionals who are expected to work together, sometimes with some success and sometimes with a little bit less success. Um, but the bulk of their care is delivered by parents, primarily in the home and usually overnight. Uh, these, these children, even when they're in a hospital or a hospice setting, will be tended to by their parents as well, um, which presents its own problems. They're also overrepresented in the black and minority ethnic communities compared to um, 
white children. And they also live in areas of higher uh, index of social deprivation. And there are growing numbers of teenagers and the under twos represented within this population as well, um, which is primarily due to advances in medical technology, which means that babies who are born with complications now live for longer. And those children who are experiencing complex medical conditions earlier in life are now living for longer. So in the context of this social uh, aspect of how care of how these children are living, what does this mean for research and research participation? Well, using the example that I discussed around the well-being of parental caregivers, when we went to go and establish what would be required of a study of this sort, we wanted to explore parent views on this research project to uh, improve their physical and mental health. We conducted seven interviews with family members caring for a child with a life-limiting condition. And these were chosen as representative of the sample of parents which are seen by Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is a large tertiary palliative care service which sees approximately 380 new referrals per year and tends to about 185 deaths every year. Um, these families were um, similar in uh, their age group, their socioeconomic status and their background compared to other children who are seen by uh, the team. And they identified that their health was important to their child's well-being, which was great for our study. Uh, they could identify at least one health and well-being issue they were concerned about during the interview, but they had no idea how to go about seeking some help for this problem. They felt they could not leave their child to participate in interventions outside the home if, if those were delivered by a research team, or indeed if those were to be delivered by traditional NHS services such as their GP. That was going to be very challenging for them. They identified issues with reading and writing, which may preclude uh, participation in research, which was really surprising to us because the majority of uh, patients that we see do still sign consent forms, and the majority of the clinical information that we give is written. Um, so the fact that they were really struggling with even basic things around research um, from a, a literacy and comprehension level was really surprising to us. And they identified barriers to health-seeking behaviour, including a lack of health literacy. These parents are experts in the care of their children. They know everything there is to know about their child, about their child's medications, about what to do. But when you ask them about their own health, they have no idea how to go about seeking help for that or what really is important to be focused on in relation to their health and well-being. And this was something which was routinely overlooked by the clinicians that they were coming into contact with who went, well, you know, your child has had this blood test thing before, so I'm going to give you the same one. I really don't have to tell you about it. And actually, that wasn't really true. Um, and it's these three issues that I specifically want to focus on today, because these are the areas where I think there could be the most scope for innovation using internet-based technologies. But taking a step back, we also have to discuss a little bit about how internet-based innovation has served this population to date. And what you find when you look a little bit at the literature, and I've got a couple of slides at the end of this with a list of references, which are available to you as well, is that internet-based innovation has really been about providing traditional palliative care services in an online setting. And when I talk about traditional palliative care services, I'm talking about online information about symptoms, such as what to do if your child has um, a problem with constipation or continence. I'm talking about telehealth and video conferencing for medical advice and consultation, which is a very traditional, I'm going to sit in front of Skype as a doctor and I'm going to talk to you about your child. Um, and it's also about symptom checking and tracking. Internet-based innovation has also led to advances in online peer-to-peer -peer support for parents, which is really wonderful. It means that they can now transcend geographical limitations to be able to speak to other parents who are caring for children with very similar conditions. And it means that they are perhaps avoiding some of the isolation that they've always talked about with regards to speaking to other parents who have similar experiences. But is that enough with regards to innovating care? I was really struck by the slide that Sue had earlier with the full list of her hopes and aspirations for what care should look like in the Scottish context. And this just doesn't seem to be cutting it. This is a very limited clinical provision, um, which is based online. So if we're going to give some constructive criticism, what can we say? Previous research has, pro has explored primarily text-based innovation. We haven't really provided much by way of video or audio 
content for those parents who we know may struggle with some of the more textual uh, based websites. Research participation takes place primarily in one space, which means that as these children move from uh, care context to care context, their research isn't necessarily moving with them, and we're losing participants in the research. And innovations have focused primarily on one symptom, which are not at all reflective of the complexity of the conditions of these children. The majority of children who receive palliative care have at least three symptoms which need to be managed at any one time. An intervention which focuses only on one symptom is not enough. And there's also no work exploring the value of mental health interventions for a child, a parent or a sibling in an online context, despite ample evidence that there is really good CBT interventions in other conditions. So how must we innovate further? Well, innovation must keep time with the clinical context of these children. These children live incredibly complex lives, and any innovation that we're designing has to be complex to keep time with how they, they are living their lives. Research must be portable and accessible in multiple locations where the child's care is taking place, so we need to figure out a way of getting through the data protection issues associated with the NHS, and also allowing us to move into the hospice or home settings with all of these interventions. And research in clinical practice needs to be accessible to those who struggle to read or write. Now I'm speaking about people who speak English as their first language, who are going to struggle with um, consent forms. We haven't really touched on the huge amount of our population who perhaps don't speak English as their first language and who may struggle with literacy in, it, in their second language. And can um, further internet innovation really help parents? Well, maybe not. As I've outlined, there are some issues of privacy and confidentiality when we're moving from all of the different care contexts. There's also some issues of privacy and confidentiality when we're talking about uh, openly accessible or commercially designed technologies, um, which is something that the NHS is really struggling to incorporate in its systems. There's also an initial cost of internet solutions, which may be prohibitive. So designing some of these interventions is incredibly expensive for the NHS, but also accessing these interventions from the perspective of a parent is also really challenging. You remember a few slides back that I talked about indexes of social deprivation. That means that a lot of these parents are parenting their child in an area which is considered to be in poverty. So can they afford a smartphone? Can they afford internet access? And if we're going to put all of these technologies online, it's really important to consider how we're going to make this technology equitable and access to this technology fair. And it's not clear how to integrate these technologies into standard care, how to move them from something which is in the research area on, on the bench and then to the bedside. And patient safety is something which we also haven't discussed. But maybe there's a role. Opportunity for the use of video, audio and interactive content to overcome literacy issues is something which cannot be undermined when we're talking about internet-based technologies. They can transcend the geographical boundaries to information, support and help, which have always been identified by these parents, because oftentimes they will be the only parent of a child with a life-limiting condition at the school gate that they know of, um, and it puts them in contact with other people. It also potentially puts them in contact with other people who could help them from a professional perspective. On longer term, these technologies may preserve some health resources as well. So while the initial cost may be quite a lot, maintaining these technologies over time does reduce in cost compared to more face-to-face -face <coughs> interventions. So what conclusions can we draw? With the right innovation, we can engage children with life-limiting conditions and their parents in research. But we have to be mindful that they need modifications to existing internet-based methodologies to allow participation in research. They're leading complex lives, we need complex solutions. And further discussion is needed to determine how internet innovation could improve clinical practice and improve quality of life of children with their life-limiting conditions and their families, which I hope we can touch on a little bit today. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I've also put up the hashtag as well. Thanks, Simone. I think what we're going to do is we're going to do a Q&A right at the end, so we'll have a chance for us all to uh, stitch together all these talks, and I've got lots of questions, so fantastic. Um, next up, we have Gabriella. 
just to point out, Ive has given me 10 minutes to talk about the 10% of my life that I could probably talk about for 90 minutes. It'd probably take me about 10 minutes to do the other 90% of my life, but I'm going to try and keep it to 10 minutes. Um, and also to say that my background is actually uh, health policy, um, and so, but I'm here as a person. So I'm going to try, uh, so this is from a personal perspective, as much as I love all the data, I'm actually lucky enough to have Lorna Fraser supervising my dissertation for my MSc in health policy, which I'm going to do around um, children with um, life-limiting conditions, support needs of, their fam of them and their families. Um, and the data is absolutely fascinating, but I'm deliberately taking a personal perspective here. So, um, oh, sorry. So this is me. So I'm, my background is health policy. I worked in PALS when I first started working in the NHS, uh, improving access to primary care, doing demand and capacity planning, projects reducing health inequalities, public health, behaviour change. All of that stuff is where I came to, uh, come from. I moved to NHS England in 2013 as a result of the Lansley reforms um, and became a mum for the first time on New Year's Day 2014. Um, I started my MSc in health policy here at Imperial um, in November 2015. Uh, I just found out that I was pregnant again, uh, and I was about 12 weeks in when I started. So this is Thea uh, on, the, on the right, and she's the tiny one in the middle. Um, very normal pregnancy. She was born on the 10th of May 2016. Very normal pregnancy, very normal early development. She had prolonged jaundice, and the four-month sleep regression never ended. Um, but none of that really was any kind of sign for concern because they're all quite normal things. And obviously we'd done it before we knew, uh, we knew that babies are, you know, they're their own beings. They will do whatever they want. Um, the real uh, sign that there was a, an issue was that she couldn't wean. It came to six months and she just couldn't swallow um, anything. So um, we started looking for a reason for this um, because otherwise she was perfectly normal. So this is her at eight months. Um, and uh, so we were told that we'd made her food aversive by trying too much food too soon, although she was six months. She had reflux. Uh, she didn't need food until she was a year anyway. She was fine on breast milk, although I'd gone back to work at six months, so that was quite impossible. Um, but she was clearly starving. She kept trying to grab food off of our plates. Um, she had very little... She was losing energy as time went on, and she was losing weight quite dramatically, um, but not dramatically enough to be... Uh, referred um, and she was drinking milk constantly um, she was clearly not sick my husband actually used to work for Anthony Nolan so we know quite a lot about childhood cancers and we thought cancer was probably the worst thing that could happen to a child um, so we knew she wasn't she you can see she's a perfectly healthy happy child um, so we didn't know really what was going on by eight months uh, however she still couldn't sit or roll and actually her skills in those areas had declined since five months um, so we went to the GP despite nine months, I think, is the referral threshold for those two things. Um, but the, the, she referred us to a paediatrician. She was great. And he, so we got, had the appointment when she was 10 months old, and he mentioned metabolic disease um, and sent some bloods off for, for a gene testing. Um, so on the 28th of April uh, 2017 was when we were due to get the results um, from the gene testing. And... Uh, on the, I'd never heard of, of the, the condition she had, Neiman Pick Type A, um, but there was that feeling on the 27th where I, I'd finished work and was doing some artwork with the kids, knowing that my life was never going to be the same again. I just there was something about, about it. I knew that, that something was going to change. And this is Thea on her first birthday. So we received her diagnosis on the 28th, um, and by the 5th she had an NG tube in. Um, and we were trying to come to terms with this um, new life that we were going to have. Um, and this is her around all that, that time. That was her first birthday cake that's all around her mouth there and reading stories. So um, we had to come to terms with it. That was, that was all we had um, to do. And really we did that by... I came to accept that actually death is an imminent concept for everybody. Anyone can go out and get hit by a bus um, at any time. And so there was no point in focusing on that end point um, instead, we would just live with our new life. Uh, we had a disabled child and that was that. And we were going to live every second to the max and make sure that whatever happened, she lived the life that she was supposed to lead, um, however long or short that might be. Um, and time, scary stuff becomes less scary in time. I remember the first time we had the NG tube in and the nurse explained that we could do that ourselves, And we both looked at her and said, not on your life. Um, within two weeks, I think, 
I was lying Thea on my friend's bed, putting the NG tube in because we quickly realised that you can't keep an NG tube in a little child. And if you have to go to hospital every time you need it reinserted, you spend your life in hospital. So you just get used to it. You accept a new level of risk and, um, and you have to get on. You adjust to a new normal. Um, you know, we already know it, but here was medical proof that she was one in 10 million. Um, so these are the things. Uh, we slowly started to return to normality. We had a, a Halloween party. She had a gastrostomy in October 2017. And that was a huge turning point to us because she suddenly stabilised. She wasn't constantly vomiting anymore. Her feeds were able to be roughly around the same time every day. She was able to be fed overnight. Her medicines were a lot easier to give her because we could give them straight down the, the um, gastro. And it was a lot much, uh, it was a lot easier. We'd got used to it taking two hours to leave the house. We'd got used to certain, certain elements of her condition, which did get worse. My husband had given up worse at work. Um, again, that was something that we kind of just accepted. Um, the, the real thing that year that made us realise that our life perhaps weren't like others was just before Christmas, my husband had to have a, an operation. He went under general anaesthetic. So I'd taken a few days off work as annual leave. And I thought, well, I can look after the kids and get the Christmas shopping done. And I did my back in. And uh, we have no family or friends living near us. We'd just moved to an area. When, we got her, um, when I found out I was pregnant with her, we'd just moved hundreds of miles away from everybody we knew. And, um, and I was doing the Christmas shopping in, uh, in tears. Every time I had to lift Thea or move her, I was, I was crying in pain because my back was... But I didn't have any other time. I needed to get it done while I wasn't at work and my husband was recovering from a general anaesthetic. We had no choice. So that was my first glimpse that things were different but you know we carry on we try baking cookies and and what have you um we had days out uh, went to see walking with dinosaurs we went to legoland we took part in our handmade parade dressed up as uh, circus dancing fleas we went to see the christmas lights um uh, and we've been to all over the place we've been for walks in the woods and all over the place um in england so we um so, uh, yeah, so as, actually, as she grew, moving and handling and transport became more of an issue. So um, she, her condition caused her pain in a lot of her joints. So simply moving her from her wheelchair into the car or from her wheelchair onto the sofa was re very, very hard for her. She lost all her upper body strength and her head control. So going up and down curbs became very, very difficult. Um, going along cobbles became very, very difficult. Changing her became more difficult. She was very tall for her age, so she didn't fit on a baby changing mat from about two. So she, we had to just change her on the floor of public toilets. Um, little things like that, actually, be, they became, but it was a slow progression. So, so we, didn't, we didn't notice too much. She was always just our, um, you know, our little girl. Um, and once she'd had the gastrostomy after that Christmas, we, um, things had started to stabilise. And we had help from our um, local uh, MSI team, the multisensory impairment team, um, to get her into an, a nursery, a mainstream nursery. We started conversations with the ARC thanks to them, and that's where my son was. Um, and she was, uh, so she, I was only able to go for three hours a day, and even that was a lot for her. Um, and she went two times a week for three hours. Um, but that was our first glimpse at real normality. She was spending time with children her own age. Um, she was a different person when she was at nursery. She loved other kids. She always had done. She's a, she's a second child, so she was used to being around other children. She wasn't used to being stuck with, a, with one of us the whole time. Um, it wasn't what we'd wanted. When she was one, she was supposed to go to nursery, and we were both going to go back to work. Um, it was important for us to get that back. I went back to, um, to doing my MSc, and we were also introduced to Holly Bank, which is a special needs school uh, about an hour away from our house where she was then able to start in the September 2018. Um, to nursery, we were the experts, but at Hollybank we were surrounded by expert, regular and reliable support. We had people who, who could advise us on, you know, uh, on her gastro site or medication or symptoms. Um, before that, we'd only had Forget-Me-Not, which is our hospice. And I know I'm not, talk I'm not mentioning the hospice very much, but, but I'll get on to it. Um, our hospice, we had two hours a week from them, and, and until she started at Hollybank, those are the only two hours a week that I could guarantee anyone that I would be in work, because if there was an issue that my husband needed help with, or, and my son needed to get to school, we had to deal with that at home, and I couldn't necessarily go in. If my husband got ill, I couldn't go to work, somebody had to look after the children. Um, so it was quite a big 
uh, it was quite a big change for us, her being able to go to, to Holly Bank in terms of the support that we felt that we received and also the, um, uh, the, the just stability that with a reliability uh, that we had in our lives. The only um, issue I think with that was that it made us, it, it gave us a proper glimpse at normality and what things might be like when she was at school. Um, it was an hour away from our house and she only went for five hours, three days a week. So it wasn't enough for my husband to get a job around. Um, but we felt that we were in a place now where we could do that. We could both work. We could, we were getting back to normal. We started to think about being able to go on holiday. We knew we couldn't go abroad, but we could go somewhere in the UK for a couple of days. We couldn't fit everything in the car otherwise for any longer than that. Um, and with my flexible hours, we thought that that would be okay. So we started asking for support to help get my husband back into work and uh, we, we couldn't get any. Uh, we're not eligible for short breaks and we weren't eligible for continuing health care uh, or for an assessment for continuing health care. Um, the the Forget-Me-Not was a voluntary funded organisation. The two hours a week was all, all we could get from there. Um, so, so it was difficult um, uh, to get that and that was the first time that we had any uh, experience with asking for help. Um, but And so the next thing that happened, this is just some of her artwork that she did at school, which should end soon, um, we thought about going on holiday. And I'd taken the kids myself to various places, that's uh, dressing up with some friends, playing with the dogs, we, we went to Wales, we went all over London, we went up to the top of Mount Snowdon, she saw the Queen, all sorts of places. Um, but we couldn't, we couldn't get a job, my husband couldn't get a job, because um, it wasn't allowed. I can't get onto the next slide. There we go. Um, the first time that she was in hospital happened because in October the, uh, 2018, I noticed that her swallow, she was struggling to actually expel her vomit. So I was trying to get a suction machine and kept being told that until we needed it, we couldn't get one. Um, not long after that, she choked in the car. Luckily, she didn't need resuscitation. I managed to get her out, but she'd aspirated. And the next morning, she had a massive seizure um, and was very, very unwell. So we called an ambulance and went into hospital where they were very, very focused on the seizure. They didn't do a chest X-ray and booked us into the epilepsy clinic and discharged us. And Thea had been asleep since the seizure. And in fact, she'd been asleep since about four o'clock since that she'd, um, she'd choked. And um, so the next morning, we didn't really know what to do. She was supposed to be at school. So I just said, well, I'm gonna take her to school because the hospital have said she's absolutely fine. Um, and I got to school and they said, I'm really sorry. She really doesn't look well. We can't take her. You need to go back to hospital or forget me not, which was our hospice. Uh, and so they phoned forget me not, who said, well, we're not taking her if the hospital haven't even done a chest X-ray. So the nurse at Hollybank, her school, took us to the hospital and said, I'm not leaving until you've actually uh, done a chest X-ray. We ended up getting admitted. We were there for two and a half weeks. Um, this involved my family traveling up and down the country and taking time off work so that I could keep my uh, job. And um, my mum, fortunately, had just been diagnosed with breast cancer, so was able to take time off work to recover from a mastectomy. So she was a bit more flexible. Um, my sister is a lecturer. She, her work were brilliant. My brother's work were brilliant. Um, but they were travelling up and down the country, taking it in shifts so that I could keep working and our son could go to school. Um, Forget Me Not came into the hospital for two hours every week, as they'd always been coming to our house. And again, that was the only time that I could reliably go to work. I was advised that um, I should really stop working because um, I should be spending the time with my daughter. Actually, um, I, it was work that kept me going a lot of the time. And we wanted to be normal. That was the whole thing that we wanted. We didn't want to be um, and also, how would, I don't really understand how we were supposed to have paid our bills or mortgage or any of that. Um, we had Christmas after that, and that was brilliant. She was out, um, she was out of hospital, out of hospice, back home and back to normal, which no one had told us she would get. Um, and, but then on the 16th of January, she got RSV, so she was in a very bad way. She was struggling to breathe, and, and she had declined a lot. Her condition had declined a lot. Um, she got better. Um, she was in hospital for three weeks and I actually refused to leave because I thought if, because none of her equipment was suitable because her condition had declined so much. And I said, I can't leave because I know that once we go home, we'll not get the wheelchair, we'll not get anything that will enable her to leave the house. So they referred us into Forget Me Not. We went to Forget Me Not for step down care. And it was the best eight days that she had had in months because they had this bed that she could get out and about. She could really 
uh, enjoy. That's her in the bed there. Uh, she could really enjoy herself. She could use the facilities. We could use the sensory room, the playrooms. They had all sorts. They had all the equipment that was suitable for her. But we went home after the eight days. Um, we had an assessment for a new wheelchair eventually. We had an assessment for a stair lift. We had an assessment for... We did have a new bed. We had an assessment for some other equipment um, to enable her to keep in a, in a... She had to be in a very specific position in order to be able to breathe because her organs were all swollen and put pressure on her lungs if she wasn't in the right position. And she was getting bed sores, so she also had to be moved. But in, in, so she had to be in a moldable foam um, wheelchair type thing all the time. Um, she was back at home after Forget Me Not and um, she was bed bound for the rest of her life uh, because we didn't have anything appropriate to get her out of bed. She, she left her bed one time um, and I believe, I don't know, but I believe that, that uh, if we'd stayed at Forget Me Not she probably would have lived a bit longer. I think when she died she, she'd, lost, she'd lost what she had to live for because you know she was very similar to me and I've always been of the mindset that I do not want to be stuck in one room for my entire life and we were finally eligible for continuing health care and the first person they sent couldn't be left alone with her and couldn't administer morphine so I was called back from a work trip to London to go home because this woman wasn't going to be able to help us she was there to do our ironing apparently I haven't ironed in 15 years um <laughs> And uh, the next woman they sent was absolutely lovely, could do the morphine, could be left alone with Thea, but she didn't really have any experience with children. So she was really, she was a lovely woman, but she was not, she was not the kind of person that we needed to look after Thea. We needed somebody who would be able to get her out and about with children her own age, doing fun activities. Uh, actually, she, she died within a week of, of coming home, so we didn't have any of these people for very long. So our lifelines were Little Sparkles Play Therapy. Um, it was amazing for her cognitive and physical development. Forget me not, we had social events, meeting other people. This is Thea's best friend and Thea's best friend's big sister who happens to be very good friends with my son. Um, that's the Forget Me Not Christmas Party. The only place in the world that we ever felt normal was when we were with other people like us. Being at the Forget Me Not, and, and I think that is the most important thing for my son him and Faith have a connection that um, I, I just can't put my finger on, and they have done since the day that they met. There is something for siblings about being around other children in wheelchairs, other children with tubes coming out of every orifice, other children who can't move and can't talk but can still live a very, very full life. That is very positive for the mental health of those siblings. And Thea, um, Thea and Shalom, Shalom actually passed away just before Christmas, um, and everybody they were at school together they were both forget-me-not kids and we are very good friends as families um, and everybody has said that she was never the same after Thea died um, and she used to she used to wind Thea up it was, they had a very very good relationship um, and a, a lot of people have said that, that she was just never the same there are those connections that mean everything to us and everything to our kids we did some advanced care planning but not until after the first hospital admission um, it was brilliant being able to have the conversations, being supported to have those conversations, my husband and I to be guided through conversations about the death of our child, not having to just find a time at home that that's okay to talk about. You know, that was not something that we would have been able to do. So that I valued that so much. But I think it was too late. Um, there were also options that would have been available in other parts of the country that aren't available in our area. You can't have an IV antibiotics in the, in the community if you're a child in our area. So we had to have a conversation about any emergency admissions to hospital. If, we, if she had a chest infection that needed IV antibiotics, we could go to hospital, but she might be put on life support and we wouldn't be able to control that. Or we could go to the hospice and not even try IV antibiotics. Uh, luckily, that wasn't a decision we ever had to make, but in, in principle on the care plan, we'd said, well, we'll just go straight to the hospital, hospice because we don't want her to be on life support. Uh, and that didn't feel like a choice. That felt like we were given we were given the option of life support or IV antibiotics, which I don't think necessarily we needed. Um, I think pain relief options could have been, in, again, in the community, they're limited, equipment isn't covered, um, and with a declining condition, keeping up with the equipment, keeping up with her decline medically, uh, it was impossible. It took um, months when she lost her head control for her equipment to get adjusted so that she could use it again. So, so we were constantly playing catch up. And you have to, um, 
you have to have something go wrong before you can get the equipment. So the, the suction machine, for example, if we'd had it in advance, we may not have ever had that first admission to hospital because I'd have been able to act. Um, so that I, it was brilliant, but um, we need to do more of it and it needs to be done earlier and it needs to cover holistic support for the family. Um, I wish we'd had more little sparkles, more play therapy, more of forget me not, more, of, more and earlier of Holly Bank, the friends and the social life going out and feeling normal. Um, and I wish we'd had less equipment chasing, less adaptations to have to make, uh, less of things going wrong before they got fixed and before you get what you need when you know you're going to need it. And in fact, Thea had a diagnosis, so everybody knew that she was going to need it. It shouldn't have been a difficult thing. There are children out there with no diagnoses and their lives must be so much harder. Me and my husband are both white. We both speak English as a first language. You know, I have quite a well-paid job. All of these things, we still remortgaged our house. We, we had a good credit record, so we were able to get good, uh, a credit card with a lot of money on it. Um, all of these things were available to us because of where we come from. And most people that we met who were in the same position don't have any of that. And it really made me question where and how society supports these children and these families who are placed in a very, very vulnerable position without any warning and without any knowledge. You cannot plan. You can plan to have a baby. You know that your finances are going to be hit for a little while and you can, you can make plans. You cannot plan to have a child with a life-limiting condition. It hits you and your life changes overnight and you don't know how... You have to figure it out as you go along. Um, the final thing is the negative approach to forms and things to get DLA to get sure we were refused that we, we were a middle rate of DLA um, at first and Neiman Pick UK the organisation that supports people with Neiman Pick um, found out and they they told me to to put them as their le as our, our legal DLA people and they got all the medical information that meant that we were put on the higher rate we weren't eligible for short breaks you have to prove that you're in dire straits before you get. Um, any access to these things and that's a shame because the only thing that kept me going was thinking positively and that my child was just like everybody else's. Oh, uh, in terms of what I want, I think there needs to be a conversation about what families need and what families want, um, what they should be able to expect and how that should be funded. I don't think it matters where it comes from. Um, at the moment, hospices in the UK are voluntary organisations largely. I don't feel that the level of support that families need should come from voluntary funds. I think there are some extras, holidays, days out, support, fun things. That is what hospices should be funding. Um, the voluntary sector should be funding. I think the essential day-to-day -day living, support to get a job and maintain employment, support to go, you know, to, to go to the park, to cuddle up on the sofa, to have a comfortable seat. To how, which was the only comfortable seat Thea ever had that was adaptable to her needs, was for, funded by the voluntary sector. It cost over £1,000, and we managed to find a charity to fund it for her. It was the only piece of equipment that suited her for her whole life. Um, I think there needs to be a national conversation about priorities and, and what these families could and should expect. And if, that, if we expect it to come from the voluntary sector, I think that's fine. But I think at the moment there's no conversation because it's a very hidden issue. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Gabby. Um, yeah, I mean, it just transforms the, the forum from all these areas that we're working in to bring this alive. Thank you so much. Um, so, last up we have... Uh, Alessandro, and away we go. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you, Ivor and Imperial, for inviting me. Uh, and thank you for the three wonderful women that present before me. I learn a lot, as usual, so thank you very much. And there's a lot of things that I, I need to learn more and more. Um, it's here, here it is. Okay, uh, okay, it's kind of difficult. Right, <laughs> using this. <laughs> okay, um, briefly, this is me. I, I, I present here three three different companies. Let's say that one is dot 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 and open dot. That I will talk it later. And one is Orto, which is interesting. 
I let me spend a few minutes on talking about this, a few, few seconds, more than minutes, talking about this. This is very interesting because the project that we will talk later on and we were, were, that we have been working the last two years together with the Imperial and Elix Center, it's uh, the client, let's say, the, the foundation that is founding that, that, uh, that project is you want to create a, a company that it will take care or get the knowledge uh, developed during this process for keep keep it for the long term project of this. So we 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 are designing a new pediatric hospice in Italy, and they really want to create a company that take care for the long term development of this. So it's very interesting, and it's the first time that happened to me as well. So it's 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 nice to say. Uh, I. Just oh, okay, it's, it's tricky. Um, the this is this is be, basically what I have been done the last five, fifteen years of my life. That working in a multidisciplinary um, um, studio, that in which is focused on interaction design. And five years ago, we found even a fab lab. Is there anybody of you who know what a fab lab is? A fabrication laboratory that is in. in it's, it's a laboratory open to everybody who wants to have an idea and develop it by using digital technology, basically. And my background, which is interesting, is, is on, on the, on the colophon, there's right designer, which it's, I'm proud to be considered a designer, I, uh, but I study philosophy, so I'm, I, I don't want to say that I'm a, I'm a philosopher, but anyway. And, and I have been coding since when I was eight because my mother took me away the game. So I learned how to code myself the game in order to keep going. So this crazy combination make me a, maybe a designer or an interaction designer then. Um, interaction design and, and human-centered design, they mainly our focus was on uh, what in the past it was used to call uh, human-computer interaction. So how the people interact with technology and digital things how to get their life or access to information simpler and so on and so on. And basically, in, we had a chance, because I, I, I have been teaching at the university as well, we have a, ch a chance to collaborate, uh, uh, starting collaborating five years ago to a foundation that takes care about babies with complex disabilities, both cognitive and physical motorial disabilities, and, and, and we start working together with them. And as a designer, and even for all of the designers that work with me, uh, it's, it's very interesting that how, how much you learn by as a designer working in the field of healthcare. You, 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 is there a designer here? How many designers? Okay, few designers, okay. And professionals in healthcare, the, the others? Okay, or the studying, of course, as well. Okay. Um, and the, what is interesting is that I think that our work as designer, even when we design a spoon, is very, we have to be very responsible on what we do. And when you are working in, in, with babies with disabilities, that is become immediately clear. They, already, they, they, they are already frustrated for many parts of their life by not being able to grab a spoon or whatever. So, if you deliver them a solution, it has to be a solution, not something that it might work. But this bringing back to, oh, okay, I, I just designed a spoon. Who cares if maybe change the way of whatever uh, the people use this? No, that is important anyway. So designing is always a matter of being responsible on what you do. Uh, and this is, I, I, I perfectly understand this by working in healthcare. And, and other things that we that that we understand uh, from from by working is is empathy first. So is inclusive design means not designing with uh, designing with people and not for people with disabilities. But anyway, and 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 this is because in 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 the the way how we design, but especially in healthcare, but in general to all of our clients is more is co-design more than designs so bring people all around the same tables sh sharing the the needs 
don't be scared about if I mean I I'm a coder, but if you're not a coder, I I'm I'm not I I, I I'm not a nurse, I'm not a, a, a therapist or whatever. So we have a lot to learn each other. So don't, don't be ashamed. And another very, very interesting thing is that most of the time we find solutions. And you realize, which is incredible, how the, the people, especially with disabilities, or families that take care about babies with disabilities, they are best problem solver ever. So they are facing every day problems that they have to solve. So having them next to you in the table, that is a really, a, a, it's a really a, a very good help. It's a very helpful because they are better than you focusing on problem and how to solve it. Maybe we have tools that then or skills that c they can help them maybe finding a solution, better solution, be more, much, much beautiful solution in case, and so on. So the, the meaning of co-design is also because of this, and for me this is very important. And one another thing that is a matter of switching from the normal, that for me technology is something to design. But for example, what I do realize in healthcare, um, in healthcare field, usually practitioner or physician, they consider technolo technology something to buy. So I buy, I, I buy a, a, a radio machine or whatever. And suddenly we do realize that technology is something that you can design as well and that you can personalize and so on. It's a very, very interesting switch. Uh, I, I, I will briefly go into two examples that we did but two examples that we did together with TOG, the, the foundation that I mentioned before, the one that cares about baby with disabilities. For example, this is a, a bike that we designed, and the main purpose why we, we designed this bike is that this kind of bike already exists, and they mainly are made by hand, by, the, by some specialists that made this bike. Usually, the, the, the queue, so the waiting, the waiting time for having a bike like this is six months, and they cost around 4,000 euros. And what we did, it, we were together with especially one family, the first family, the Lorenzo's family, and, and, and the therapist, of course, and the practitioner of the foundation, for figuring out, and w first, the first things that we did, we created a, um, a tools for measuring, for taking the measure of the baby, and then we designed a parametric uh, soft, by using a parametric software, we designed a shape of the bike that by getting the, the number out of this measurement tool we, and in inserting the number into the parametric design, in a couple of minutes you have the correct shape for the baby. And the, that shape is directly sent to a CNC machine that creates the shape. So there's still some handmade process but we digitalized the entire process together with them. Then means that right now this bike, it, it can be produced in two weeks and it costs 1,200 euro. So we reduce the time, and our point is reducing the time more than the cost, but finally we realized that we, reduce, we will reduce the cost as well. Uh, another project that we are working and we have been working last one and a half year, that we are developing a, a tool for, for improving the cognitive abilities of the baby by using eye tracking system that is very helpful. And, but we do realize that most of the time this eye tracking system that is very well known and used for uh, motorial disabilities, they don't keep in mind that babies or in, in this case babies, but person they can have both cognitive and, and motorial disabilities. So there's few, few tools that they are designed for them. And because of that, we, we have been founded by a, a, an Italian foundation for developing this. But focusing on the topic of the, of the forum and even the work that we are doing and we have been done together with Elix and, and, and Imperial College. Uh, actually, I'm here since yesterday that we had the workshop yesterday, all day long yesterday on, on, this, on this project. Uh, this is an hospice. We, we are kind of lucky that he, mm, w th this is an hospice that he, he, he is, is going to be built in the near future in Bologna. And the, the architecture is very nice, but because it's been made by Renzo Piano, mm, 
whatever even, but he is. <laughs> but it's very nice. But it, it, it actually, um, it, it's, it's very. At the same times, uh, being beautiful, it's it's also part of the therapy. So, uh, I I don't want <laughs> I don't want you. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. There's. <laughs> Let me keep going. Uh, okay. It, it, what is very interesting, as I mentioned since the beginning, the the coordination and even the family. So the foundation who found it even ask us to create a, a company that it will take care about the, the overall process since now until maybe the next 10 years. So even together with them, we do realize that all of the innovation, it, it, it cannot be done in one year or two years, but you should manage, even for the co-design that we, I was mentioning before, you should manage how to keep this innovation ongoing and changing your mind and refer to what's going on, the technology change, even internet, the people, they might be more avid on using technology or not, or whatever. Everything can happen, and even it's, it's a matter of not fixed stuff, but keeping on, on development. So we have this complex uh, situation that we have to deal with. So the, the coordination made by, again, the family, the, 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 the foundation, then the Imperial College and the Elix Center that um, we are very lucky to work together with them because especially in UK you have a, a very uh, good literature and, and experience on palliative care and pediatric hospice, which this is actually the first one official pediatric hospice that is going to be built in Italy. And then we, we are part of the Italian team, so the one responsible more on on making, making stuff together with the Elix and then the, the Renzo Piano for the architecture. Uh, what is interesting then of the design approach is that it's not only a way how to design things beautiful or useful, or, but it's even a way of keeping in mind the overall and the entire process. So we start really from the, the awareness, and, and the awareness even not only refer to the family that did we deal with this uh, palliative care or, or health care special fields, but even the people around, so the, the, either the older or other, uh, all the other uh, citizens that maybe have prejudice or bias on what hospice is, especially in Italy that we don't have any hospices. So we even to teach and, and other people, the citizen of Bologna in, in this case particularly, or in Italy in general, that hospice is maybe something different from an ad, especially pediatric hospice is something different from an adult hospice, and 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 because of that we we will start from awareness and referral then all of the the phases that already uh, Ivor pointed out in the, in the introductions uh, this is m m more or less or more or less is is the is part of our methodology and process and uh, it, there is where we are right now so we just um, uh, we just finished the discovery and the define phase, which are mainly doing research, interviewing people, having, have, spending time together with nurse, family, and asking them, and, and getting out of this interview the insights for pointing out the needs. That, of course, there's a lot of needs, so even the effort or of pointing out some needs that you can... That, that are feasible in short time, or, or that are feasible in general, or where where you can deal, or or where you can deal, and, and and where you can help really being a designer, and then we define, then and and then we start again. This double diamond is quite famous structure that we use. So you leave you free to to diverge at the beginning when, while you're doing research, then while you are defining, you have to converge on, on some specific idea for so forth yourself. And we, we at the center of the dial dime on a few months ago, we released this, which is a guideline design document. That, uh, we, we, that document is, is, is a milestone for, from our point of view that contain all of the research that we have been done, some comparison metrics between all of the um, 
the offer done by the hospice in, in, in UK, but not only in UK. And then we use some, some methodological uh, uh, sketches and we create basically, this is a blueprint, is, is quite well known as a user journey blueprint that is, is very useful uh, that you do it together with some families or, or that you imagine a normal life. It, 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 it doesn't have to be really connected to a real life. It's a tool, as every, every, every tool, that has some limits, but it's helpful for uh, point out some touch points that you might be, have to be focused on and they might be helpful. So as you can see, sorry, is in Italian because all of the documentation was done in Italian because in Italy, few people speak English. So it's, it's much better, but nah, it's true, no, <laughs> come on. Or, or I mean, the one who is speak English, is, they speak English like me, so amazing. <laughs> that, he, anyway, I'm joking, but any, no, it, it's, it's easier. It's matter again of languages. So it's much more easier that the stakeholders that we involve to keep them simpler, the access of the information. So mainly it's because of that. So we, we decided to switch all of the documentation in Italian for doctors, for families that they might want to dive into, into the, um, the process again. So this is how we design. So we imagine that and the, the, the balloons are actually the, the touch points. Talking about touch points, I, I, will, I will show you one example of what touch point means. And this is something that we get from engineer, engineering that is we, we define some functions that we want to, that, w w that is part of the need, that come out from the needs, and then there's the touch point up there. So in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, allow that kind of function, we need the devices, which you can see that up there. The, the touch point that come out from the book, there are around 40 touch points that we have to keep in mind. That means that they are not all solutions that you have to do customly, that they are solutions that you have to keep in mind while you are developing a, a project like this, which it may be the electronic health records that have to be processed and done in a certain way. That means CRM for customer relation and management that have to be done in a certain way. Even BMS, so building management system of the infrastructure that have to be done. So you need to take care about many, many aspects from the architectural until the families and, and so on. Pointing out that all of this work has to be done, uh, has to be done human centered, so from the point of view of the family, mainly. So this is the journey of a family. So we, we our, our center of all of our research, they were the family that I forgot to say. This is what we mean as a touch point. This is already mentioned a way how we can use internet and, and the technology in order to monitorize the vital signal of a patient. This is a quite famous product already available on the market, which is Empathica Embrace. And, and this is how we, we create the, the, the sheet on how to analyze and why we, we point that this is a touch point that we have to design, that we will start designing on or, and working together in the co-design as I, as I mentioned before. And, and, and of course, while we are doing so, we are also scouting some emerging technology or already available technology. So sometimes we do need to design it custom, some other, or adapting, or much better, adapting assistive technology to the needs of the family. Unfortunately, most of the time, the, the tendency of the, the, of the technology itself or the people who design technology is design technology for technology but not for the need of the people. So that's sometimes happen, unfortunately. Uh, for, uh, as a final conclusion, after five years working in these fields, especially with the foundation that I mentioned before, we decided to, and we, we were figuring out that there were always something exactly happening in the same times, more or less. So um, w we decided less than one year ago to, to spend a few weeks on creating a sort of manifesto with, oh, oh, okay. with uh, some, some advice that we give us 
first and might be helpful for, for somebody else for, for co-designing healthcare. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so if I can get our speakers to sit to the front, I think um, we'll open up the um, lecture room to uh, any questions. If you guys have any questions um, for our speakers, um, we can take some. I have some questions myself. Yeah. I wonder whether um, I understand that the UK... In the UK, the government contributes quite a small amount towards funding of, of, of hospices. I wonder, is the UK unique in that position, or is that seen worldwide where they're mostly charitably funded? It's a good question. I think um, they're almost exclusively charitably funded. Um, I think in what we found what we found interesting was that they all seem to globally they all seem to have the same story of families creating a service for themselves, connecting with other families, and that kind of spontaneous. Uh, thing happening. But uh, uh, is there a clearly? Yeah, so I think the only exceptions to that would be uh, the Children's Hospice in Kuwait, which is entirely government funded. And then um, the Children's Hospices, there are three in Canada, two of which are related to the hospital, so they're effectively just an offshoot of the hospital. So they come under the same funding regimen as the hospital and can be charged under Canadian health insurance to the hospital. My understanding is that the rest of them worldwide would probably be voluntary, I think, but I'm not sure. Scotland has a slightly better mm -hmm. um, funding arrangement than the rest of the UK, um, and I think we lobbied probably, <laughs> told the story quite, you know, um, the Scottish government over a long period of time to try and get equity with adult um, hospices in, in, in Scotland who get 50% of. Um, operating costs uh, funded by statutory. Um, the reality is that 50% doesn't actually equate to 50% of your running costs, but we um, managed to agree a, 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 a five year funding uh, agreement with the Scottish Government so we get uh, £30 million pounds over, over five years, so it's about £6 million, pounds, which isn't quite, isn't half of our running costs, but it's, it's, it's certainly a huge contribution, much, much better than the. English situation, which is allows us to, I suppose, put money back into the system. So we know our NHS colleagues want to do palliative care, so we're funding the hospital team. It's an NHS team, but we're putting that money, getting it from the Scottish Government, but giving it back to the NHS. It's kind of, you know, just like, yeah. Uh, particularly of staff, but even just for what we would consider to be core core things that the, the hospice needs. So it's it's things like training and retention of staff, even simple things like you know, managing to pay their utilities can sometimes be a challenge. Um, so yeah, that, that is something that they, they discuss quite a lot, actually. It's, it's been a major problem. And I think when we look at the places of care where children end up, it, it's, it's increasingly the hospital. And that's because there really isn't an alternative when we're talking about sort of a skill shortage and a lack of funding for <coughs> community-based services and also for hospice-based services as well. So it's that it's not being recognised, or is it that it's being deprioritised? I think I, I think there's a lack of awareness, and um, I think it's really hard because the medical and the socio and social and em emotional needs of families can't be separated. And yet, the only way you can get funding from the NHS is by proving that you can save money on bed days and reduce length of stay, which actually you can do a lot by investing in proper community palliative care. For, for, and, well, for me, I would say community care for any disabled ch child. Um, but it's this, you know, Thea very often fell through the gap of being... Um, of, of, of receiving any support because we were not dependent on benefits and because she was medically very, very well. Her first hospitalization was when she was over two and a half. 
um, and, and and the only time that she was eligible for the intensive support was very much in her last week of life. Um, there was n there, there was no you know, and people have said to me since, but she was tube fed, so she was reliant on technology to survive. Therefore, you should have been eligible for continuing. Well, you should have, would have, could have. It doesn't matter. There were, we were coping. Um, and, and quite often, unless you're not coping and somebody that's serious risk, and even then I would argue that there is, there's an element, there's a safeguarding element here for all siblings, children, and parents. Um, because no, you know, you have very, very strong drugs at home and nobody asks any questions about Mm. child has died, I mean, if you want to take it to an extreme. But um, but those those needs, the social, emotional, and, and long-term healthcare needs of the wider family um, aren't taken, they're not taken into consideration. It's the only, and we have no data, we don't know who these children are, we don't know, until we know how many children and families really are in this situation where they have a quite severely disabled child um, and what they need, until we know that, we can't fund adequately, you can't fund something a question there, Yeltop? Yeah, I was going to pick up on that point. I was going to ask, is there any research into the equivalent co the cost of not funding it? Because if you look at, the, as you mentioned, the, the work days lost, the time lost, the, those, the, your husband going on a boat, it will have to get off the job for a second period. Surely, like anything in the NHS, you could justify it based on days lost and, and financial cost to the, the economy. Is anyone doing research on days lost and cost of not funding, or not nationally funding? the interesting point because actually to stay at home and, and stay in one room is free um, yes you're losing money from not going to work but you could argue this child's care is costing nothing but actually what is that costing that child's mental health yeah. if they can't leave the house because they've not got the appropriate uh, transport you know and if you're not free you can't get a wheelchair accessible vehicle yeah. little things I was also going to the point of how much money is, as, a, as a society as in the country from, uh, from you as a family being workers because then surely then the question I was going to ask is, would it, would it be in governmental interest to therefore fund and have to provide greater funding to uh, services, knowing it will reduce the costs and loss in the work areas? Charles, Charles have done a little bit of work with York, um, YHAC, um, the, the Economic Consortium, um, and I don't know if our stuff has been published actually, but I, I'm sure it's um, something that I could share via um, either. Um, but we did look at what is the cost that Chad in our, um, you know, every pound that we fundraise and then spend on palliative care, what does that save society um, and uh, in terms of looking after not just the one child but the, on average, five family members around that child 
um, and looking at DC and hospital admissions, um, etc. So, um, and uh, it is the return is something for every pound that we um, is given to us in, in statutory funding, we make it go uh, uh, about uh, three, four times further. You could go even further than that and say the mental health of the siblings mm -hmm. will be carried on through their lives. Now, mm -hmm. me and my husband put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of thought into how much we did and didn't involve our older child in Thea's care, how much we told him about what was going on, how aware he was. These were all very, very, very difficult conversations. They were, they were, we were just guessing, you know, par par parenting is, is your best guess at the best of times. Parenting in this situation is really, really hard, and we had to put a lot of time and effort and energy into thinking about how we involved Calvin and how how we've done that beyond her death. And I mean, it's undoubtedly he will have had an impact on his life. Um, we have done our best to try and hope that that is a positive impact and that it will make him want to to give back to society and to work to improve the life, you know, and, and, and all the positive stuff that could come out of it. Um, but it's very, very difficult. And when you're caught up in a situation where, you know, essentially when you put your child to bed, you do not know if they're going to be alive when you wake up the next morning, that takes its toll on you as a person. And it takes a lot to, to be able to, to compartmentalize yourself into your different bits and and again you know that that depends on a whole support network of people around these siblings to make sure that they get the best experience <coughs> possible from what is a really really awful time um and you know it, it it's hard and the more children you have the harder that's going to be we had a question behind uh, yeah um I'm, I'm Chief Executive of Children's Hospice, actually, so don't get me started on funding. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, but you'll be here for a while. Um, I was going to ask about normality, because it came up a lot in your talk. Yeah, we had yes. the last time, do you remember the last time we saw each other, we were lobbying politicians for funding, which was fun, but I'm not talking about funding. Yeah. Um, it's also come out of a, a bit of work we've done talking to parents of, of children uh, with life and conditions as well. The thing that they tell us that they often crave is normality mm. and actually that's quite even more so perhaps the case for the the parents who are at home um, particularly if they've had to give up work mm. so that sense that you really beautifully described of this is how i thought life would be and then this hit us mm. um and there's a real sense of um actually sort of sense of grief actually about mm. having to give up work having to give up identity um, and some of the words in children's hospitals have used the word grief like it. And I wonder whether innovation is the right way of looking at it. So the tools, absolutely yes, but innovation tends to imply something new and you, know, you can watches that go on your wrist and machines that beep and gosh. We have whereas, those. Yeah, <laughs> and we get funding for those as well. <laughs> but what you needed, what one thing you got was a chair that worked mm. really well for your daughter. And one thing which it sounds like you didn't get very often was somebody who knew how to care for kids with complex disabilities so you could leave the house. Mm. And I think there are innovative tools you could get which would come up with solutions, like mm. you know volunteers doing a bit of housework or something. It doesn't sound innovative in the way that a machine that goes beep does, but actually providing those things can be quite astoundingly complicated sometimes. Mm. And I wonder if we sort of switch to looking at problem solutions rather than innovations, might be a better way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that was a question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it's a good framing, right? Uh, because this kind of ties into a little bit, well, it might segue into the question I had for everyone, which is around, um, you know, to what extent, because what I loved about all the different talks was we're talking about... Uh, hospice as a service, the kind of the, the, the needs of families, the experiences, the kind of opportunities. And I'm kind of wondering to what extent, you know, the, the, the space for innovation, if we talk about the hospice as a, as a place, what I was struck by, and I mentioned this because you even talked about Thea and her friend, and that the idea that they had, you know, that space to be friends, and they had that coming together, that kind of crossroads, 
to what extent does the hospice um, become a hub for families to meet and be together and provide the kind of human level of support that might not be as strong as care support in the home but has all those kind of psychosocial elements mm -hmm. to it like there's a tension right between building a place which is locked in and kind of fixed but then you get a lot from it so I'm just kind of wondering what everyone thinks about that kind of issue yeah. I mean yes I think I think it doesn't sound innovative but actually you talked about the bike for most children having a bike isn't in innovative if I could have got a bike that they could have gone on that would have made my life um, the, the, the picture at the beginning at the beginning of your talk you know those things aren't aren't difficult you know for most people those are everyday things lifting you know we had to make sure that that if we wanted to cuddle Thea on the sofa and all watch a film together as a family we had at least half an hour where one of us would be able to just stay still with her on our laps because otherwise it wasn't worth her moving from one piece of equipment to get onto our laps to have a cuddle which was essentially a selfish act on our part that is a hard thing as a parent to understand and to come to terms with but enabling using simple innovation like people helping and being able to have these spaces where where there is a, a bed that's mobile that's actually everybody that you can climb on and cuddle her and then you're fine things like that are so so simple but they make the biggest difference and what was your question again it was about well just about oh, about Thea's friend and it yeah. being a place yeah absolutely there is nothing that it, you feel differently you know every day I, we had feeding machines to deal with we had medicine we had syringes I mean I took a picture of my living room one evening after the kids went to bed and texted it to our family WhatsApp group saying we look like we live in a drug den um, it really was that bad it was like syringes all over the place and bottles of stuff um, there is nothing that makes you feel better than mm. being surrounded by other people who have all that stuff mm. too and and oh whose machine is that it just it just takes a load off your mind relaxes in a way that I can't explain I didn't even know was possible until the first time that the two of us families went out for the day together and we both got home and we were like that was really normal it was so much fun we f felt more relaxed than we'd felt ever before that mm. after that mm. experience no, I totally agree, and I t agree even that some solution is better than, than talking about innovation, or, I mean, I don't refer innovation only to technology, mm. in that sense. That I, I, I do an example that we, we the, the baby, most of the baby with disabilities that we work with, they, they need postural support or mm -hmm. postural devices in order to keep, it, keep them in the right position. And in Italy, we have this policy that all of the baby with disabilities, they work, they go to school together with the others. So we don't have special school. school. We have special people that stay on the side or they help these baby with disabilities that go with in a normal school. And, and we, we redesigned this portable device as a machine and together with therapists, of course, and practitioners. And, and the result was that before all of the other babies, they look at the girl, uh, as a strange, with a strange device. Then, we, by just designing the device in a more beauty way, that looks more beautiful, all of the other babies, they feel less than her, and they really want the same machine for them. <laughs> so th that start fr they switch from being strange in cool in just one action. <laughs> and from, from psychological perspective, for a baby, she is uh, eight years old, Becoming cool in an action from being strange for years, maybe it's it's really has an, a very high impact on families and for and on her especially. And this for me is very in, let's call it innovative, but I don't know maybe. But this is a very simple action. Absolutely, and we have the same experience of that when we first had to get shoes for Thea for her standing frames. We were imagining these big black boots that kids used to have when I was a kid. <sighs> Um, and we got to look through a catalog. There were only three designs, but they were all beautiful. And her shoes, she only had ever two pairs of shoes, and they are our most treasured possessions because they are such beautiful shoes. And we went from not thinking she'd ever be able to wear shoes to thinking she was going to be putting these horrible, nasty, big boots with massive straps on to getting these really pretty, pretty little things with pictures on that just like you would have chosen from a shoe shop. And that, that made us both feel amazing.
about children's palliative care or children's hospice care or, um, uh, you know, I suppose, so I suppose actually introducing families to the concept of a children's hospice is more, about, more than about death and dying. That's a huge barrier, but I think we're, we're slowly overcoming it. Um, there are um, barriers to, you know, the, the volunteer um, programme we want to, we do involve volunteers in, of, in direct care um, of, of children because actually we can see that we'd be able to do so much more in both our hospices and in families' homes if we had really well trained and supported volunteers supporting direct care. But actually people are a little bit scared about that. It's like, what do you mean you can, you, you can possibly involve? We can, it's okay to ask a volunteer to do the gardening and the ironing and things, but what do you mean they might help mm. read a story to a child or help with a, a play with a child or help feed or, or do some, some element of care? And actually, so there are real barriers, both from, um, mostly actually, I think, from staff who are a bit worried that that eats into the, but that's what we do. <laughs> so there are barriers in that. I can't think, um, hospital services, they're just, um, yeah, uh, sometimes I think you just got to kind of push on and, and mm. do things and, and take a bit of risk and, and yeah. It's funny the restrictions stuff. around volunteers when, you know, as a parent, yeah. you're told, oh yeah, by the way, this is what's wrong, there's your machine, bye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I think um, the barrier from a research perspective is really about how every child is different. Mm. Um, so, you know, we don't really try and have different children in randomised controlled trials. We try and make them, you know, the same. Mm. We'd really like it if they were, you know, these perfect little lab mice, but actually children with life-limiting conditions just aren't that. Um, and as I said in my talk, they live really complex lives. And having to sit with that complexity and that difference is something which makes it really challenging from a research perspective. Um, and I think it's, it's part of, it's been one of the, the barriers to establishing a proper really robust evidence base for palliative care is that it's really difficult for us to do trials. It's really difficult for us to do these kind of larger scale studies. So it's it's really important that we, you know, catch things and, you know, learn a little bit more about how many children and the types of symptoms they have. But when we're starting to try and innovate and figure out exactly what we should be doing to improve their lives, that gets really tricky from a research design perspective. Um, and it's, yeah, I don't think anyone's really come up with Really and maybe also an element of the medical community, the medical model is, is about fixing things and fixing people. And these are children that can't be fixed. That is uncomfortable emotionally on a human level for everybody. Mm. Uh, it's uncomfortable for medics because medics didn't go into medicine to help somebody die. They went into medicine to fix stuff and and a lot of medics won't have come across a lot of these conditions unless they work in this field. Um, you know, we've been talking with some other colleagues who I've been working with about um, education and training of the workforce and why do we get situations like uh, Charlie Gard where the parents end up coming up in conflict with the, the medical staff at the hospital. That was nobody's intention. How's that happened? Why has it happened? Is it because of a lack of familiarity? Uh, these children are, you know, each one will present differently even if they've got the same condition actually. Again, a medical model focuses on the condition and the symptoms and this and that's not how these children work. They are all individuals and even with the same condition, they present totally differently and children with different conditions could present totally the same. And in some ways they're exactly, the, you know, Shalom and Thea in some ways were exactly the same and in some ways were the total opposites of each other. So Thea was totally floppy and Shalom would go really, really stiff. Um, you know, the little things like that. So their equipment needs were totally 
different, yet we had exactly the same lots of equipment. Mm. I think this is what that kind of question and those responses to me kind of uh, really clarify like why holding this forum and actually bringing these different perspectives and different uh, 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 disciplines together is why we're doing this. And I think that's a really, um, although it kind of feels like there's lots of challenges and lots of uh, issues, I think all the ingredients are there to kind of just work through them. And I think that's something that I'm particularly looking forward to developing more of and seeing how we can kind of stitch these things together. Um, so I think I'm going to have to close up. Uh, I just want to thank our speakers. Um, can we just give them appreciation, please? Thank you. Um, and thank you to you for coming. Um, just to say that there is the next Global Health Forum on the 19th of March, uh, which is around cybersecurity, which is a super interesting topic. Uh, so please come on to that. Thank you.